Hi everyone! So on today's video we'll talk about anticoagulants. So in order to understand the anticoagulants it's really important to understand how the clot formation happens. So there are two pathways for the clot formation. The first one is the intrinsic pathway in which basically the blood vessel wall is damaged and it will release collagen and this collagen leads to activation of floating factors. So, when the collagen is released, it will first uh, activate our factor 12 that will become activated. So, A stands for activation of the factor. Then, this factor 12 will activate our factor 11, will become activated, which then activates our factor 9, which in turn activates our factor 10 then our factor 10 is responsible to activating the prothrombin which is the factor 2 into thrombin which leads to activation of fibrinogen into fibrin and then the fibrin is the one that is going to give some strength to the clot that is formed. Then, secondly, we've got the extrinsic pathway. So, basically, the endothelial cells in the blood vessel, once they get damaged, they will release a tissue factor which will activate the factor 7, which will become activated, which leads to activation of then factor 10 into factor 10 activated and that's the point where both pathways converge and then we've got the common pathway which leads to ultimately formation of fibrin that will basically stabilize our clot that is formed. So let's talk about one of the most used anticoagulants, the warfarin. So, warfarin. Basically, the warfarin is responsible to prevent the activation of vitamin K epoxide into vitamin K reduced. And this is done by an enzyme called epoxide reductase. So what does warfarin does? It does block this enzyme so the vitamin K doesn't get reduced. And why is that important? So basically, in order for our clotting factors, some of them get activated, they need to be carboxylated by vitamin K reduced. So basically the factor 7, the factor 9, 10 and 2, protrombin, they need the vitamin K reduced to do the carboxylation of their glutamic acid in order to get activated and warfarin will prevent this happening. So that's how it gets their anticoagulant effect. So the warfarin is the most used coumarin anticoagulant. And why? Basically, warfarin is completely absorbed. The food can delay its absorption, but not the extent of absorption. Then also because of its potency, duration of action, and also reliable bioavailability. So that's why it's a really good anticoagulant. However, there is a delay in the onset of the anticoagulation effect of warfarin. Why? Because it basically doesn't have any effect on already carboxylated clotting factors. So, basically, we see that it will prevent the activation of factor 7, 9, 10 and 2 but it doesn't do anything to the existing ones already activated in the bloodstream. Then, it's really important uh, to understand that the warfarin does have a very, very narrow therapeutical window. So, because of that, it's really important that the INR is monitored. So, basically, INR needs to be monitored in order to do any adjustments to the warfarin dosage in case it 
it's needed. So we can balance the risk of bleeding against the risk of clotting and keep it safe. So the INR levels, the targets, they differ according to the condition that we are treating, but most of the time the target should be 2.5. Then if it goes too higher, that means like the blood is too runny, so we might need to decrease the dosage and vice versa. So the main side effect with warfarin is bleeding and that's why we do regular INR levels so we avoid that side effect. And also another thing to consider with warfarin, either you are a doctor and you prescribe it or you are a pharmacist and you do clinical check on prescriptions, is it is really important to understand if the patient is taking any other medications that can interact with that because there are many many drug drug interactions when it comes to warfarin or also drug food interaction. That's really important to keep in mind and always to educate our patient on that as well. Lastly, another interesting fact about warfarin is that there can be some variability of response because there can be some genetic variations in the gene that encodes the vitamin K epoxide reductase. So the gene is called uh, VKORCI gene and because there is room for variability in this gene then patients may respond differently. And before we jump into another type of anticoagulants just give me a thumbs up if you are enjoying this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any future videos. Let's jump into it! So we just talked about the warfarin and now we'll see another class of newer anticoagulants which are the direct acting oral anticoagulants so the dogs so we've got um, we've got the bigotron the dabigatran will directly inhibit the thrombin which is the factor 2 activated whilst we've got also a pixaban Rivaroxaban and Edoxaban which the three of them are direct inhibitors of the factor 10A and by inhibiting the factor 10 activated then will block the cascade and block ultimately the formation of fibrin. So when comparing the direct oral anticoagulants to the warfarin, these newer drugs they present shorter half-lives and also they don't require like a constant monitoring, INR monitoring like the warfarin. So that's an advantage. However, we still need to do some regular checks on patients that are on this medication. Direct oral anticoagulants also present less interactions with other drugs when compared to warfarin even though they still present some interactions so it's always good to keep that in mind especially because all of them they are a substrate of the pig glycoprotein so either inhibitors or inducers can either increase or decrease the anticoagulation effect of them so which checks do we need to do regularly so basically, renal function needs to be always uh, monitored. So renal function should be monitored before starting the treatment with any direct oral anticoagulant, but also periodically after starting taking them. And why? Just because all of them, they are excreted through the kidneys in the urine. So if by any chance we have any severe renal impairment, then we won't be excreting them as much. And then if that happens, we'll accumulate more in the bloodstream, which can lead to bleeding as side effect. Because they can also, the main side effect they have is bleeding. And because of that, also need to keep an eye on signs of suspected bleeding. So what does that mean? So basically, we need to see if there is heavy bleeding and that includes, for example, in the women, if they have heavier menstrual bleeding. Uh, we need to keep an eye for red or brown urine. We need to keep an eye for bloody stools or dark stools. If there is unexpected like pains in the joints, any swelling, any blurred vision, 
any signs of anemia and we should always educate the patients to keep an eye on those signs. And lastly, last fact, the bigger trunk is a protrug. So what does that mean? The bigger trunk is not orally active once it's taken. It needs to go through our liver, it's hydrolyzed and then it gets active. So in case we've got a patient with impairment, hepatic impairment, we shouldn't give the bigger trunk because then that will have implications in the activation of the oral anticoagulant. All right, that's it for today. I hope this video was easy to understand just because this class of anticoagulants, it tends to be quite confusing and there is much stuff going on. I tried to simplify it a little bit so you would get like the main aspects of each drug and see you on next video.